In the book of Daniel, chapter 10, verse 21, a holy angel named Gabriel said this, I will show you what is noted in the scripture of truth. Is the Bible the scripture of truth? Can a Muslim trust this book? You'll find out in part two of a special series called Good News for Muslims. Welcome again to a 13-part television series called Good News for Muslims. This is part two, which is called Can a Muslim Trust the Bible? Uh, my guest is a man named Shabazz, who has a fascinating history. He grew up in Iran. He's got a, a lot to tell. He is an associate speaker for Amazing Discoveries. He is the author of a uh, very interesting book called Two Sacrifices, One Destiny. He is also uh, the host of a television broadcast called Voice of Hope that airs on the Hope Channel in different countries around the world. So Shabazz, uh, welcome again. I'll shake your hand and you know you Good are to be here. you are much appreciated mm -hmm. uh, and I'm, I've just been fascinated by listening to you. Uh, I grew up in basically the Hollywood Hills and you grew up in I don't know if they were the hills of Iran or not. The hills of Tehran. <laughs> the hills of Tehran. So we have uh, very different backgrounds, but now we're both married, we both have kids, and we're both here, and we both uh, believe in God, and we've both found, we found peace in our hearts that we didn't have as yes. we were growing up. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna just you know, continue to discuss uh, Christian, Islamic issues, and just kind of dive deep. And uh, you're the expert. Uh, I've done some reading. I've met Muslims, but I wasn't raised Muslim. But one thing I've learned, and you can kind of elaborate on this, is uh, that Muslims believe, they do believe in the Quran. I've got my copy of the Quran here. They believe in the Quran. Uh, but it's, when it comes to the Bible, you know, they have certain views of this book. We've yes. got this book and this book. So tell us uh, about the Muslim view of the Bible? Muslims, uh, for the most part, I can, I can safely say that all Muslims believe that the Bible is a corrupt book. A corrupt book. It's been corrupted. Okay. Originally, it was not corrupt, but that the Apostle Paul um, basically uh, changed the Bible and uh, included in it uh, things regarding Jesus being the Son of God, Paul the Apostle is to be blamed as far as the Muslims are concerned. And interestingly, they believe that, most Muslims believe that the first five books of the, the Old Testament, uh, the Pentateuch, the writings of Moses, have been preserved and they are not corrupt. And, and that, those, that's the five books that we have or that I have in my Bible. These first right. five books, uh, Muslims would accept those as the Word of God. Most Muslims would accept that as and the Word of God. that doesn't matter whether they're a Sunni or Shia or... It doesn't matter, no. Okay. No, they have not been corrupted as far as they're concerned, but the rest of the Bible has been corrupted. And, and, uh, and uh, interestingly, when I was uh, studying this for myself, early when I was learning about Christianity, I was, I was questioning the, why is it that the Bible is made of two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Torah and the Injil, the, the, the writings of Moses and the prophets and the kings, and then the writings of the disciples of Jesus. How can they be connected? And why isn't Koran the third part of it? it you know, that was a big question in my mind. And why is that Koran stands apart from these two? And these two agree, but that one doesn't agree with them. That was one of the big questions I had, and, <laughs> and Muslims see that as, as they basically 
if you question them, they see that as the authenticity of the Quran, that, that it cannot be part of these two, because these two are corrupted. And, um, but later on I found out that the reason these two are connected is because, uh, be, because they agree. It's like a brother and sister. And it's like uh, uh, you, you have two faiths, that 66 books that came together in a span of 1500 years, written by different authors, but they agree in every point. The Bible has no schism but with, with it, but for itself, with itself. There is no schism anywhere. The verses agree with each other. The, the thought flows. The prophecies agree. And the history is there. Everything there in the Bible became, as I studied it, as I looked at it, as I compared it, became more and more clear to me that there is, uh, there is authenticity to the, to the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and that's a big, that's a huge issue, and I've heard that too. Muslims say, and it's kind of like in the Mormon religion, they say they believe in the Bible insofar as it is correctly translated. And I think that, I guess, the Muslim mind would believe somewhat in the Bible, but insofar as it's correctly translated and if there is corruption in it, and if the corruption doesn't agree with the Quran, then they would put the Quran above the Bible. Yes. Is that right? Yeah, yes. For the, the, I would say, I would agree with that. And, and that, that they also believe, just plainly believe that there are verses in the Quran, in the Bible that should not be there. That was put there deliberately and it was corrupted. And, and the argument is, basically the argument, the natural argument that arises out of this is that why would God invest so much energy and time in this book mm -hmm. only to let it be corrupted? And was God not powerful enough to protect His own word that He wanted to give to the world? That God would say, I didn't take account for that and now I got to do something else? So, so they do believe that He, he preserved the first five books. Yes. But then He didn't preserve the bulk of the rest of the Bible, but then he did preserve the Quran, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm just looking at this and thinking, well, if God is able to preserve the first five books, you know, why isn't he able, like you said, why isn't he able to preserve uh, the other books? Yes. And, and, and let's just, let's discuss, you know, the evidence for the Bible uh, being preserved by God. I mean, uh, to me, one significant very significant fact is if you look at all the books that have ever been published, including the Quran, and if you look at you know all the books that have ever uh, been sold and translated into multiple languages around the world, by by far, the Old and New Testament uh, is 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 the winner. Yes. Uh, and if you think about you know God and the ebb and flow of humanity. Uh, and then you look at the, the book that surfaces in the history of the world as the world's all-time best-selling book by far is this book. You know, to me that, that just, that says something. It speaks to the heart that doesn't it make sense that the Creator would preserve His own book down throughout history and this is by far the world's bestseller. I totally agree. So uh, that's to me that's very significant. Yeah. Now, now you'd mentioned, you know, the Bible was written over a period of approximately fifteen hundred years, by how many different authors? There are sixty-six books, okay, and there are at least I can't remember the exact number of the authors. I think it's at least forty. F forty, about forty, I think, of authors in the Bible that, that and, through and, different time, and so. they're very different. I mean, you have. Uh, an administrator, Daniel, who's in the administration on, in the court of Babylon. You've got Amos, the shepherd. Yes. You've got fishermen like, uh, you know, Peter. You've got a tax collector, okay. Matthew. You've got uh, David, who was a shepherd and who then became a king. You've got Solomon, who is a king. And you've got all these different, uh, you know, writers from many walks of life. And yet when you look at this uh, combination of all of these books, the later books refer to earlier books, quote earlier books, earlier books point to things that are in the later books, 
and and they they fit. Yes, they fit together. And the complexity of this whole matter is so broad that it will be impossible to to even imagine that that when Moses wrote the first five books, and at the end when John wrote the last book, that these two who could have collaborated in any way to uh, it, it, there was no collaboration between them it was the holy spirit that was leading all these men to write the book just as god has ordained it and it was written exactly the way god wanted it to be of course it was written in their own style each author of the books of the bible were, they were human but god's holy spirit was guiding them guiding their thoughts so so the inspiration in the bible there is no question in my mind that this book is inspired. Now, now what about the Dead Sea Scrolls? What, let, let's bring that into the mix. Uh, what does that say? What is the significance of the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls concerning the validity of this book? Well, you know, the Dead, Dead Sea Scrolls, I mean, historically, they're a pretty new finding. I mean, back in the 1940s. 1947. 1947, a shepherd boy, a Bedouin boy, who was uh, not even uh, Jewish, he is throwing rocks, he throws a rock into a cave and he hears something shatter. Click, click. Yeah. And he throws another rock and then eventually he goes up there and he finds all these, uh, uh, all these uh, basically bottles made out of clay. And inside them there were squirrels. And then anyway, scientists and uh, archaeologists got a hold of them. And when they compare them, those those writings were are around uh, 100 years, 200 years before Christ, a couple of hundred years before Christ. From the Dead Sea from community. The, yes, that's right, from the Dead Sea community. And when they the compare it to our, to our modern translations mm -hmm. of the Bible, uh, there's almost no difference. Yeah, and th that's the significance of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Is, uh, one of the books that was in one of those jars was the entire book of Isaiah. Mm -hmm. And when that book, going back, you know, a couple hundred years before Jesus, uh, and you compare that with the book of Isaiah that we have today in our modern Bibles, uh, it's, it's virtually identical. Yes. And the significance of that is that it, it uh, testifies that the book of Isaiah has come down the line to today and it has not lost a lot in the translation. Now, obviously, there are some, you know, variants in different translations which is another topic, but by and large, you know, Isaiah back then is Isaiah today. That's right. The first five books of Moses are the first five books of Moses today. That's right. Psalms back then is Psalms today, and, and so on. Yeah, and and the, the, the continuity of the Bible and its inspiration and that, that the Bible is preserved, in my mind, there is no question at all. And the Bible, the Bible deals in the records of Scripture, we're not dealing with, uh, with you know, fantasy and mythology. We're dealing with real people, real places, real history, real names. You know, elaborate on that a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the people that are mentioned in the Bible, archaeology has found evidence that these people actually existed, kings and noblemen and different uh, people that have been like Hezekiah, the king of Israel. David, they have found uh, one of the seals of David. They have um, uh, found, most recently found a seal that belongs to the prophet Isaiah. There is still some debate. They're trying to uh, finalize whether it's actually is the prophet Isaiah's own seal. But um, in the near future, we'll find out. But but there are places such as Babylon mentioned in the Bible that the ruins are in Iraq, not far from Baghdad. And, um, and uh, so all of these, these places and people and history that the Bible mentions, archaeology, every year they're finding evidence that backs up all of these stories and these individuals in the Bible. And, and it just, it, it, it's something fascinating and amazing because it just proves everything that the Bible has said. And here in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 28, it talks about Cyrus. And in chapter 45, it again mentions Cyrus, that he would open the two, the two leaved gates. The gates would not be shut. And it describes how Cyrus 
was going to conquer Babylon. That's right. And uh, this was actually written about 175 years or so before Cyrus was even born. That's right. And Cyrus uh, was predicted to conquer Babylon, to dry up the rivers in chapter 44. In verse 27, it says, God would say to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up your rivers. And from what I understand, what the Bible describes is that, and well, actually what history describes is that Cyrus came from the north. He, he uh, diverted the water of the river Euphrates that went underneath the city of Babylon. And there were two gates on both sides. And as the water went under, uh, the guards that were supposed to be watching the city, they were drunk that night. And the water went down and they didn't notice and the gates that were supposed to go down to the riverbed were not down that night. And then as the water went down, it opened up a gap and Cyrus and his men who had diverted the water upstream, then they crept underneath those gates and that's how they surprised the city and conquered Babylon. And so that was described in the Bible. And when I was a number of years ago, I had the privilege of, of going to Europe and traveling and I went to, uh, to England and I went to the British Museum and the day that I was there, uh, I, I had been told that the, that the Cyrus Cylinder, this ancient cylinder in cuneiform writing, was there in the British Museum, and I wanted to see it, where, which, which, which was Cyrus's own description of how he conquered Babylon, right. which lined up with the prophecy in the Bible. Right. And uh, that particular day, I was told that the Cyrus Cylinder was in a room that was under construction, <laughs> and I couldn't get in there. And so I, you know, put on a, a little puppy dog face and I pleaded, I said, uh, you know, I really would like to see that cylinder. Is there any possible way you can let me in? And uh, they did. Wow. I, they, someone went and opened the door and I went in and I saw behind the glass with my own eyes, I saw the Cyrus cylinder, uh, an archeological find that described how Cyrus conquered Babylon, how he dried up the river and the gates weren't closed, which is exactly what it says in the book of Isaiah. And so, you know, that was very impressive to me. So we're talking about uh, prophecy, we're talking about history, we're talking about uh, real events and a real person and a real cylinder that's in the British Museum. And, and what's amazing is that Cyrus himself, in that cylinder, he credits God for all of that. He says, the God of heaven has given me the nations of the earth. <laughs> and uh, he understood, at some point, he understood that God had anointed him for a special reason. And, and uh, uh, so all of these things in the Bible is being proven by science and archaeology. It's just amazing. It's just fascinating. Yeah, to me, another, uh, you know, another big evidence is the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible. And this is what I what I teach, what White Horse Media does. We have uh, numerous television programs. I travel around the country and sometimes overseas and I give seminars, especially on the book of Revelation. And many times in front of audiences, one of the points that I'll bring out is that the book of Revelation is a masterpiece of literature. It uh, takes themes and names and history and places and events all throughout Bible history and it weaves it into this incredible prophetic tapestry, uh, applying it to events that would be happening in the history and down from the time of Jesus down to the end of the world and beyond. And this book is so deep. Uh, I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll take one verse and put it on the screen and we'll study that verse for a half hour or for an hour and look at the depth that's in that, mm. in that verse. And, and to me, you know, the amazing thing is the, the evidence within the book of Revelation is not only is it extremely complicated in taking all these things from all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament and bringing that all into this final uh, incredible mosaic of prophecy, but the book was written by a man named John. Yes. And John says when he, in this book, that he was on the island of Patmos, which is a real island. You can go for a tour on the island of Patmos today. Yes. And he was a prisoner uh, during the time of Rome for his faith. And he heard a voice behind him and he turned around and there he saw Jesus uh, in his glorified body with his face shining like the sun. And, uh, and Jesus then gave him the book of Revelation. 
And he told him to send letters to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Laodicea, these different places, which were real places. And, and then throughout this book, John will say things like, I turned, I saw, I heard, I fell down at the feet of the angel who showed me these things. And John simply says, you know, this book was given to me in a vision and I saw it and I was told to write these things down. And then at the end of the book, he talks about those who, who lie and how they will be, they will ultimately end up in the lake of fire. And so here's a, a man who got the vision, wrote all this down, says, I didn't make this up and talks about liars, uh, you know, meeting a, a fearful fate. And if he was a liar, you know, that just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And the fact that he got all of this and it's so complicated and he says it was given to him in, in a revelation. Uh, you know, the evidence, the internal evidence is that John did not just make these things up. Amen. You know, he saw it, he heard it, he wrote it down. And we have this complicated book that just didn't originate in the mind of a man who decided to just, you know, creatively uh, put this book together. I it's should. just the, the internal evidence doesn't fit. And, and all this, for God to invest so much, only to let it just slip away would be a, a ridiculous idea. Now, now prophecies, before we finish this program, uh, there's something about the Bible which are prophecies that were spoken in advance of the events before they happened. You know, talk a little bit about that. This is further evidence that this book is not just man's book and it hasn't been corrupted, that it really does say things that come true. Well, you, you know, we, you and I talked about this the, the other night as we were discussing these programs, that, you know, when I compare it, for instance, let's just apples to apples. If in the, in the Quran, when you, you, there are no prophecies in the Quran, there's no prophetic interpretations or there's no pro prophecy at all. But when I looked at the Bible for the first time, as I was learning the Bible when I was still a Muslim, looking at the Bible and and I, I understood that there are prophecies in the Bible, I was really interested to know what do they say and have they come to pass. Okay. And, um, and as I looked at the Bible, as I looked at the prophecies of Daniel and as, I sh as, as, my, as a person who was sharing these things with me, studying them with me and as I was looking closely, I began to see a sequence throughout the whole Bible wherever there was a prophecy that you would have some kind of a either an interpretation of that prophecy or a fulfillment of it. And of course, there are still some prophecies that were still waiting for them to happen. But when I look at, for instance, in the book of Daniel, where it prophesies about the Messiah coming. In Daniel 9. Daniel 9 and dying for, for us and um, giving the time that mm -hmm. it would, he, would, he would minister for three and a half years. And, uh, and, and he would minister for a week Three and a half years, he would personally minister. At the middle of the week, he would die. And then the rest of that week, uh, his, his representatives would minister. And a week being in the Bible, seven, uh, a period of seven days, which is a period of seven literal years. Which, but, but the fact that I saw this, that the Bible predicted there's a Messiah coming and that he would die, not for himself, but he would die for the sins of the people. That got me really interested to know, okay, this is much more important than I've ever even imagined possible. That the Bible predicted this way back then in the time of Daniel, and then it was fulfilled in the time of Christ. So if the Bible is correct in that sense, when it actually, actually accurately predicts something and it happens, then it's accurate every other sense as well, everywhere else in the Bible. I can trust it. Yeah. There, there's a lot of prophecies in the book of Daniel. Daniel 2, Daniel interprets the dream given to Nebuchadnezzar of the big metal man yes, right. and the head of gold represented Babylon followed by Persia, followed by Greece, followed by Rome. And Daniel was written around the sixth century and that's exactly what happened. Babylon was followed by Medo-Persia, which was followed by Greece, which was followed by Rome. And you mentioned in Daniel 9, we have a prophecy of a, a certain amount of time at the end of which the Messiah would come. And when Jesus was here after his baptism in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. 
and he fulfilled that prophecy. He knew he fulfilled it, and he was referring to it. That's right. And you have uh, Micah 5, verse 2, that predicted that the Messiah would be born That's in Bethlehem. Right. That's right. And Jesus was born in Bethlehem. So you have example after example, and you have, then you have Psalm 22, which Jesus quoted as he hung on the cross. And we've talked about that, that yep. has uh, numerous statements. And this was written by David uh, approximately, a, you know, a thousand years before Jesus came. That's right. And Jesus quoted this psalm, Psalm 22, verse 1, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He quoted that when he was on the cross. And you just go right down the line. And doesn't this chapter also and talks it, about his crucifixion? In verse 16, it says, For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. And then it says, uh, I, I mean, it, everything that happened to Christ is predicted here about a thousand years before Christ even set foot on this planet. Right. So, you know, th this phenomena of prophecy and fulfillment, prophecy and fulfillment, Daniel 2, Daniel 9, right. Psalm 22, Zechariah, uh, talking about how he would come into Jerusalem on a donkey and the Bible predicting he would be betrayed by a friend for 30 pieces of silver. And point by point by point, we have this uh, incredible tapestry of prophecy and fulfillment, which is not found in any other major uh, book of any of the world religions, including the Quran. That's right. And, and um, I would like to point out to Isaiah 53 is just filled with predictions about Christ and what, ha what will happen to him from physically in his mind, emotionally, you know, that in verse, verse 5 in Isaiah 53 says, but he, speaking of Christ, was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed. It's a prediction of his coming, speaking in past tense, but the Bible is just in every sense, in every prediction, it has come, it, it has, has come true. true and is fulfilled. That's right. We'll pick this up next time. We've got just a few seconds left. Uh, there is a lot of evidence that this book is more than just a normal book, that it really is a book that God has his hand on, that has come from God. We have prophecy fulfillment. We have things going all the way down to uh, today that are happening right in front of our eyes. The average person and a Muslim can trust this book and ultimately we can find the peace that it points to. Uh, no matter who we are, what we've done, that peace is available to you and to me. We hope you enjoyed watching Good News for Muslims with Steve Wolberg and Shabazz. This entire 13-part series is now available on DVD. To order from within the U.S., call Whitehorse Media at 1-800-782-4253. To watch the series online or for more information, visit the website, www.goodnewsformuslims.com. <laughs>